So thanks Mobile UX London for having me um, on this conference. Um, I'm here today. My name is Itamar Medeiros. I'm originally from Brazil, but I'm, I'm speaking to you from, from Germany. And I'm here to talk about something that is really dear to my heart, not just because um, it's something that I've been um, personally uh, struggled with, but also something that affects directly my work here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it in a second. But as I talk to more designers in the design community, I also learn that this is a conversation that needs to be had, uh, right? Um, no matter how uncomfortable it is, which is psychological safety and the importance of this. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about four things today, and I hope that this is going to be um, something that you're going to be able to take to your practice and bring it back to your teams. First, the psychological safety is a prerequisite for creating shared understanding, right? I, d I don't know about I don't know about what kind of projects you involve, but in the last 20 plus years that I've been working on, something I noticed is things are getting more complex. The projects are getting more complex in terms of the kind of domain knowledge that designers uh, need to acquire for for solving the real difficult problems in the world. Um, but also the complexity of the network of relationships that that we need to operate with um, to solve some of these problems, right? So teams are getting bigger. There are uh, designers are influencing a uh, wider range of stakeholders. You have to work with more people. So creating shared understanding is basically a is 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 going to be very hard to get anything done without creating shared understanding. And we're going to come back to this in a second, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. Uh, the other thing is that I'm going to talk about today is this idea that conflict is inevitable, right? Um, psychological safety is a conversation that needs to be had because it's something that people are not really comfortable dealing with, right? Which is conflict, right? So we have to acknowledge that conflict is inevitable and but it doesn't have to be destructive, right? So we, we could deal with conflict in a much more productive way and psychological safety is gonna um, allow us to do that. Um, psychological safety is also not possible if there is not trust, right? Which brings me to, to the idea of like conflict is only possible when you actually, I mean, conflict is only productive once you're able to trust each other, right? Um, or if you think about it uh, from the other perspective, let's right, say people are not going to open up to each other and we're not going to be able to create the learning environment if we don't trust our teammates, right? So, and the last thing I'll say, uh, we'll talk about it today, is that if we are going to foster team environments and cultures where psychological sa safety can thrive, uh, our teams need permission to fail, right? And basically, like people are not going to, take risks if they feel they're going to be punished. And, uh, and I'm using the word punished here in a very broad sense, right? I um, mean, one end of the spectrum, you could think failure as I could get fired. But on the other, ex on the other extreme could be failure is like people are afraid of having to deal with the psychological angst of just of the stigma of being perceived as a failure, right? And both of them are very negative and have consequences for people and might might prevent them from taking risks right so let's talk about the first one right the psych uh, shared understanding <laughs> basically I mean just if I could give a very quick definition of shared understanding is this idea of collective knowledge that the team builds over time right for the kind of work that I do I have to constantly check if we are on the same page about the problems we're trying to solve, strategy, and so on, right? And shared understanding helps a lot with that. Um, the, 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 the funny thing that I noticed over the years is that people tend to under, or actually overestimate how much shared understanding they have like ab about the problems they're trying to solve. Like someone writes a specification or someone creates a PowerPoint presentation, just goes quickly click, and then all of a sudden everybody understands what we have to to work with. And usually all it takes is for me to just ask a question, right? Say, but yeah, but what is the problem we're trying to solve here or or and for whom? 
And then if you get different answers from the people in the audience or in the meeting, then you realize that the shared understanding is not there. And so just to give an idea of the kind of work that I do, um, as, as a, a director of design strategy in SAP, I'm constantly challenging the teams to answer questions like this, right? Um, strategy being the sandwich, let's say basically the connective tissue between vision and tactics. Usually I'm, 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 I'm challenging the team to take a step back and not jump directly to solutions and think about um, these strategic questions like what are our aspirations, what are our challenges, what is it that we want to focus, which tend to be more the vision related questions. And then things like, what are our guiding principles? What, what activities that we need to do? How are we gonna measure success? And the thing is, if you think about it, no one is gonna challenge any of the stakeholders or, or ask the team around like, hey, um, are we on the, are, do we all agree that we are all working on the same challenge? People are not gonna ask these questions if they don't feel that their questions are gonna be well received, right? Or yeah, but maybe they ask these questions, they get a kind of a non-answered and then people just move on, right? So the psychological safety will actually allow for people to feel free to even ask these questions, right? So. Basically, when the team works, operates in, a, in an environment that they don't feel safe, it undermines innovation, right? So in building up the case that the um, psychological safety is a prerequisite for, for shared understanding, when people don't feel safe, there's a low common ground, right? So there is low team learning. In a sense, let's say people keep m repeating the same behaviors and at some point basically making the same mistakes, right? And which leads to low performance, right? So if you put your manager hat on, you probably, the, the word that jumped to your, to your, to the screen was the performance, right? Say, yeah, let's create psychological safety so that teams perform better. But I'm looking here at the long term. I'm thinking of things of not just performance, but teams that are highly engaged which by the way, I don't know about you, but I want to work on something that I feel engaged uh, about it, right? So um, s teams where the climate is not safe, they're not gonna be highly engaged, right? Because they are not learning, they're people keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And we're gonna talk about also, let's say, sometimes even acknowledge that you're making a mistake is already a big step forward, right? But also teams that, um, Sometimes people can get too comfortable. We're gonna talk about it in a second, right? When teams create, they have the shared understanding, everybody knows what they're working on. So the next time people throw this jargon to you in a meeting, it's like, are we on the same page? I, maybe this is a way to think about it, let's say. Are we on the same page means everybody knows what we're working on and probably even more important is like, why is this that we're working on is so important, right? And obviously the, the thing that actually cares the most is like we are all looking at the same outcome. We all, we are all try, uh, aiming to achieve the same goal, right? So, so that means conversely, the teams where there's a great environment, people feel safe, they have high common ground, Teams are constantly learning from each other, learning through achieving something great, but also learning from their mistakes, which ultimately lends to high performing teams, right? So now let's talk about the, the, the second point, right? Let's say the psychological safety and conflict. Um, different cultures perceive conflict in different ways, but I would say I've been, I've I mean, I've, I've operated in many different cultures. Let's say I'm originally from Brazil. I lived eight years in China. And now I'm living eight, year here, eight years here in, in Europe. And I know that some cultures tend to be perceived as more direct and more open for conflict. But let me tell you something that the, the ethnography and the anthropology books are not going to tell you is this. Most cultures, no matter how direct they might be perceived, they 
do struggle with how to deal with conflict. Some cultures like 100% totally avoid it. Others tend to be a little bit more open about it. But in, in most cases, pen people tend to have a negative view on conflict, right? So, which, which is something I think that we, a myth that we have to dispel, right? Let's say psychological safety is not about people just being nice to each other, right? Uh, because it could actually create this artificial sense of security, right? Say there's artificial sense of peace, right? Psychological safety is the idea that people feel safe to take risks, right? N in the sense that let's say people are not gonna be punished or humiliated for speaking up, um, bringing up their ideas, their questions, right? So it's not the absence of conflict, right? So my, my friend Dave Gray, um, he wrote this book called Liminal Thinking. And I think if you go through s some of his arguments, and which I think is not just his arguments, but it's just common sense of psychology and analysis, is that if, if there's an absence of conflict or there's this artificial peace, basically all you're doing is, is all the mistakes and all the, the concerns and all the frustrations are they are not being verbalized, are just being repressed, right? And usually, um, you know that that's not good when you're repressing your emotions, right? So, and this wouldn't be a, <laughs> a strategy presentation if we didn't have some sort of quadrant, right? So the, the way that y I, you would analyze this quadrant here is the following, right? Like if you want, in, um, if people feel free to do whatever they want and there's no accountability, and or consequences, and, and I'm not talking about consequences here necessarily in the sense of punishment, but in a sense that let's say people don't challenge it each other or their concerns are not being raised, then things get too comfortable, right? And you might, you might think that comfortable is actually good. Um, it, it does feel good um, in, in the for a while, but in the long term, comfor comfortable is probably not, not good, right? On the other hand, there's a lot of accountability, but people don't feel they have permission to fail. Uh, that's gonna create a lot of anxiety, right? So, and, and this is a recipe for all kinds of, of mental health issues. And I'm using the word here, feel, which is, which is something that I think is really hard for a lot of managers to deal with. And, and feel in a sense of perception, right? Let's say it might not necessarily, I mean, people actually might be entitled to fail or let's say our company mission and vision says, let's say, yeah, we have permission to fail and your manager, let's say you, you spoke to your manager, your last one-on-one is like, that's okay, it's not, you, you can try this and blah, blah. There's all kinds of talking about permission to fail, but if people in their heads, they don't feel that, like there's there's this perception that they're going to be punished if, if they fail so the actual permission to fail is not there right so psychological safety creates this this sweet spot where people can they are motivated to try they are willing to take risks and when and when there's failure or something doesn't go according to plan they can acknowledge their mistakes and tell each other to screw up. So this is from the uh, personal ownership of their failures, right? But on the other hand, the team also thinking about the the psychological the, the psychological safe environment is the teammates are not going to hold those grudges and and the mistakes against their teammates, and they all learn from each other, and then we all helping each other, right? So, uh, which brings me to the third point is which is psychological safety and trust, right? Let's say tr you're not gonna be able to deal with conflict if, if you don't trust each other. And I think the classical uh, management framework for, for performance management is the idea of those five, defun five dysfunctions of, of a team, right? So Patrick Lencioni came up with this idea of um, the, think of the Maslow a hierarchy of needs well, these are the Lencioni hierarchy of, of, of dysfunctions, right? Let's say before people can address conflict, they need to create, they have to have the trust, right? Let's say, so there's this idea of where, where, where there's absence of trust, 
people don't feel vulnerable to each other or open to each other to um, to talk about their challenges, right? So I would love to have more time to talk about the other ones, but let's say, I, I guess this is a long way of saying that um, before you can address conflict, you have to create trust first, right? So, and I, I think, and this is where things get um, really uncomfortable for a lot of people, including myself. I, I'm not saying that I've, I've mastered um, these skills. This is a constant struggle that most people have to deal with. Is like, if we are going to create psychological safe spaces, then we have to deal with vulnerability, right? We have to recognize that uh, facing vulnerable, uh, being vulnerable takes a lot of courage, right? We have to let go of this constant worry about what people are think thinking about us, right? Um, we have to focus on our attention, like, and this is, I mean, you've probably, I mean, I don't wanna be yet another presentation to talk about mindfulness and stuff, but let's say the research does show that things like mindfulness helps. But definitely, um, you don't have to worry about being perfect. It's actually the opposite, right? Say so the more that you think about perfection, the, the more um, you're gonna try, even if it's subconsciously, to be invulnerable. Which brings us to the last point, which is permission to fail, right? So um, you, the, the, the teams that tend to operate on, a, on, a, on an environment that they feel very safe, they do feel that they are, they, they are allowed, there's permission to fail, right? So there's many ways that this could, that this could be done. Um, my friends Jeff Gotthelf and, and Josh Seiden, they, they, they are the proponents of the Lean UX um, uh, method. They feel very strong about um, the idea that teams are only gonna create this environment for learning if they are s feel safe to experiment. Right? And experimentation, I think there's quite a lot, there's a big movement around, let's say, testing business ideas with David Bland and Osterwald that the idea is like the innovation comes from trying things and, and, and learning from, from the experiments, right? So the challenge with this approach to learning is that experiments by nature are bound to fail, right? Let's say if you're just trying experiments, you're not failing, maybe you didn't push hard enough. Let's say maybe your experiment was, like you, you, you're thinking from, let's say a confirmation bias perspective, you're just trying something that you already know that's that that is gonna work, which technically you're not learning anything new because you already knew what that's gonna, what that the experience is gonna turn out, right? So, in a good experiment, you learn as much from failure as it's from success, right? So if if you are being stigmatized for failing, then the, you're not gonna take risks next time, right? So. There are a couple of, of approaches, a few approaches that um, that you could try to to create these environments where people feel safe to experiment. One of them is sandboxing, right? Let's say, and this is something I've been telling a lot of of designers that try to go down this path of let's say, hey, this is n I mean, the way that we work here is not working. Shall we try something new or propose a new method and so on? And and one one way I think a lot of designers try to think through this is the idea of if there was a mandate from the top that all of a sudden we're gonna use Agile or we're gonna use Lean UX or something. And one one approach that I, I try to 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 encourage designers is this idea of sandboxing, right? Which I, I also learned from from Jeff and, and Josh. The idea here is like you tr pick something, pick something small that you can experiment with and try, and then try to own this from end to end, right? Or the idea of let's say agreed up front with the stakeholders or the leadership, like what are the bounds for experimentation, right? Let's say nobody's gonna, let's say, hey, you had a great idea to to of of a, of a new product, but that means that we will have to literally throw the cash cow of our company out of the window. Nobody is going to be, I mean, there obviously there should be consequences for failing on something like this, right? Because like the, the, the revenue and the, and the, and the viability of the company is riding on, on a big project like this, right? So 
don't try don't try to play fastball and say yeah let's experiment with something um, which has a lot of eyeballs on it right so that's the try something small or agree up front with um, with your stakeholders that um, that may let's say what are the what what is the criteria for success here and what are the boundaries of what what we can or cannot experiment with right so this is the idea of sandboxing the other thing that I think is very counterintuitive is do the pre mortem right let's say think up front what would failure look like right because once you have this idea of uh, of of you can visualize what what um, what failure will look like first, it creates this psychological, um, the psychological buffer, right? Let's say you can already anticipate the possible reasons for for failure and then prepare for it, right? And then all of a sudden, prepare failure is not going to feel so negative. And obviously, the one that I think this is the, this is the one that I think. Uh, there's quite a lot of teams doing a lot of lip service to it. Is this idea of blameless, blameless po postmortem, right? Um, re re replace postmortem here by retrospectives, right? So if you've been working on on agile environments, you've probably heard of retrospectives. And technically, teams should do this every time. I mean, sh people should teams should be doing this very frequently, right? Not necessarily at the end of every sprint, but every time that the team is, is struggling with something, that usually some sort of postmortem or retrospective but let's face it if these these postmortems are just to catch blame then people are not going to take risks right because they know that there's going to be all this kind of dress down in the end um, in some sort of postmortem all right yeah so this is this is these are some of the tips that i had for you so thank you so much for for being willing to listen to a talk about psychological safety. If you want to learn more about it, um, I wrote a l there's a there's a reference that I wrote a little bit longer than this that you can check. You can also follow me in LinkedIn and Twitter. And if you have any questions, just reach out to me there. So thank you so much for having me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>